We affirm the resolution resolved. The United States federal government should increase its diplomatic efforts to peacefully resolve internal armed conflicts in West Asia. Our first contention is emboldening adversaries. A lack of U.S. diplomacy makes our adversaries believe we aren't involved in the region, emboldening aggression. Empirically, when America disengaged from the region, CBS 22 explains that Iran launched missile strikes on Iraq, Yemen, and Syria. With Iranian diplomatic ties at an all-time low, Parsi 22 writes that by initiating negotiations, the U.S. can bind Iran to a new nuclear deal and curtail aggression. A diplomatic shift would be a win-win, as Aga 21 finds that Iran recognizes that ending daily suffering from sanctions outweighs advancing its nuclear program. Historically, Saleh finds in 2019 that when Turkish aggression against Syria escalated, the U.S.'s diplomatic sanctions and withdrawal of Kurdish troops from Turkish borders successfully halted conflict. Indeed, Runstorm 19 furthers that hostilities greatly decreased after this specific ceasefire. Hagerdale of Harvard University 19 finds that absent the U.S.'s presence, Iran would exploit its military to dominate Israel and other allies with cruise missiles and drones. Horshig 19 writes that because Israel sees Iran as an existential threat, they would launch a preemptive attack that Avery 20 explains would risk millions of lives. Our second contention is repairing Gulf relations. For years, Saudi Arabia and Iran have been locked in a devastating war for geopolitical, economic, and sectarian influence. This conflict has manifested in proxy wars between pro-Saudi forces and Iran-backed Houthi militias across West, West Asia. U.S. diplomacy is the only hope for a peaceful resolution for two reasons, and the first is reassuring allies. For decades, Brown 17 finds that allies such as Saudi Arabia have depended on U.S. security guarantee, which promises that the U.S. would defend its allies with superior military capabilities. However, weapons with agree without agreements are useless, as Morgan 22 finds that Saudi Arabia has publicly doubted U.S. credibility and accelerated weapons buildup. Empirically, Brands 18 concludes that after President Obama began the pivot away from the Middle East, Saudi Arabia rapidly militarized and started the proxy war in Yemen. Devastatingly, Yale to Wall finds that if a country ramps up military investments, its adversaries will also militarize or initiate a preventative war to preserve a regional hegemony. In fact, Evans 21 finds that the Houthis in Yemen recently militarized and announced preparation for war, as al Zrar finds two weeks ago that the Houthis launched a series of drone attacks on Yemen oil ports. This extends beyond Yemen, as Rubini 17 finds that U.S. disengagement has set off a chain reaction where all regional powers, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Egypt, Iran, have all announced that they will acquire deadlier conventional weapons and potentially go nuclear. As allies proliferate and distress spreads throughout the region, the potential for miscalculation skyrockets, as the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations OIT finds that a West Asian nuclear arms race risks conflict, threatening hundreds of millions of lives and wrecking the global economy. The second is fostering security coalitions. U.S. diplomacy is key to a ceasefire, as Nassif 18 finds that due to arms sales, oil purchases, and security commitments, the U.S. is the leverage to pressure A, our ally Saudi Arabia to work on an agreement with Yemen, but B, our European allies bring Iran to the negotiating table, and C, the Houthis through sanctions that could cripple their military. For instance, just three months ago, Law 22 reports that the U.S. quelled the risk of conflict between Lebanon and Israel by brokering a maritime boundary. With ties strong enough to unite the Middle East, Ron 21 concludes that the U.S. is the only actor who can foster peace, which Hana 20 finds is crucial because if the war in Yemen continues by 2030, 1 million people are going to die from conflict, 9 million people from malnutrition, and 22 million people from poverty. To protect millions of innocent lives, we are so proud to affirm. Palo Alto negates. Our first contention is terrorism. Terrorism is currently down. The Global Terrorism Index in 2022 reports that deaths from terrorism are now 59% lower than there were at their peak. Deaths in the Middle East North Africa region have fallen by 87% since 2016. This is because the U.S. is pivoting away from West Asia after two decades of interventions that bred terrorist threats. Paris 22 writes that the U.S. is changing its strategy and seeking to reduce military presence in the Middle East and reorient U.S. policy to the Middle East. The maximalist goals of regional transformation, once emphasized in the Middle East, are now more narrow and targeted. However, renewed diplomacy increases terror threats through aid packages. Tokdemir 17 writes that aid is a tool in diplomacy that shapes public opinion. Foreign aid is used as a bribe to gain the influence of other nations. Aid can be used as a carrot, especially when given to other nations, to influence their stance on international issues. More importantly, aid pushes recipient states to comply with U.S. interests. <clears throat> 
Aid may intervene in domestic politics by creating social and political winners and losers by reinforcing the current situation. Aid offered with the goal of reducing anti-American sentiment may actually be backfiring, with one result being that the image of the USA becomes even more tarnished among the social and political losers, empirically concluding that political losers are more likely to express negative attitudes towards the US as aid increases. And anti-Americanism triggers terrorist recruitment. Glick 10 finds that anti-American attitudes increase the threat of terrorism. The IT suggests that a high-status, powerful group will be viewed as an imperialistic enemy, an arrogant, manipulative exploiter. The consequences of viewing a group as both powerful and malevolent are profound. Aggression towards such groups, even if preemptive, can be psychologically justified as self-defense. If there's widespread consensus that the United States is not only powerful, but seeks to dominate, the recruitment of terrorists is undoubtedly aided, and the ability of terrorists to count on the passive assistance of the populace enhances their ability to operate effectively. The impact is state collapse. Spikes in terrorism cause state failure and civil war. Aliyev 16 writes that the presence of violent non-state actors in fragile states emerges as particularly conducive to state failure, and failed states spill over, as Kobe 18 explains that failed states cannot control the spillover of domestic turmoil beyond their borders. Finally, Michael 18 finds that failed states are the biggest generators of humanitarian crises and refugees. Our second contention is Yemen. Aggression in Yemen is currently down. Khan 22 finds that the warring parties have not returned to the same level of violence. The Houthis have refrained from launching missiles and drones across the border. The Houthis are almost defeated, as the MEI 22 finds that as for the Houthis themselves, the group has long claimed that it seeks peace with other Yemenis, regional powers, and the world. With the war at something approaching military equilibrium, their rivals unifying against them, and their economy in freefall, they are likely to seek peace soon. However, the Houthis see negotiation as weakness. It's quite possible that the recent signals sent by the Biden administration, intended to encourage the Houthis to return to the negotiating table, encouraged some within the Houthi leadership to believe that the door was open to an intensified military campaign. The exact opposite of what Biden intended. This emboldens the Houthis, as Firestein 22 explained that Joe Biden took two steps he hoped would advance a diplomatic breakthrough in Yemen. He appointed a special representative for the conflict and announced the US would throw its weight behind the diplomatic effort. Crucially, neither step has produced the desired result. Iran increased its illicit weapon supply to the Houthis to enable more lethal attacks. And the Houthis misread Biden's intentions, believing that his actions to pressure Saudi Arabia to end its military operation in Yemen would open the door for the military victory of the Houthis. Rather than agreeing to return to the negotiating table, they increased their military operations. And the impact is conflict. Khan 22 explains that the war in Yemen threatens to spill over into the broader region, with Bowl 22 concluding that if the war in Yemen continues to 2030, 1.3 million people will die, 22.2 million more people may be forced into poverty, and 9.2 million may experience malnutrition. For these reasons, we strongly urge a negative ballot. Given that there's been U.S. aid provided in the past, why didn't we see an increase in terrorism? We have seen an increase in terrorism. So when the U.S. did the most aid in the region was like, earlier this century, right? And that's when we saw the 9-11 you know, attacks. That's when we saw the like resurgence of ISIS and the Islamic State. The entire reason for these okay. attacks was because the US was very present in the region and yeah. was doing a lot of aid in the region. So that one example is from a century ago. So just last year, we sent Wait. $650 million mm -hmm. in foreign aid to Saudi Arabia. Why didn't we see a resurgence in Wait, terrorism? I'm confused. What do you mean a century ago? Didn't you just say it happened like a century ago? No, it happened, the, it happened at the turn of the century. So oh, in about 2001, yeah. right? The 9-11 okay. attacks? So it happened like 23 years yeah. ago. So what about just last year when we ramped up increased mm -hmm. foreign aid? Why didn't we see an increase in terrorism associated yeah, with that either? Because like Saudi Arabia, the amount of aid we give Saudi Arabia is relatively small to the total amount of aid we actually gave in the region in like the early 2000s. Also, so, Saudi Arabia is a staunch ally of ours. So like we can generally rely that they're going to use their foreign aid for their own purposes. The real problem is when we give foreign aid to very unstable countries, which is what you're encouraging. So right? your link only triggers when we give aid to who? Like to which country? Yeah, so like we're generally saying that when you give aid to unstable countries. So like which ones? So like what you, you talk about Iran. Iran is an unstable country. There's lots of protests going on right now. Let's say we were to give aid or humanitarian aid in Iran. It would likely create political and social winners and losers, which would link into the terrorism we talk about. Because when you don't give so, aid to certain groups, they dislike the U.S. and start terror groups. But may so, I ask a question? Yeah, that's your... Wait, hold on. Really quickly, right? That's your mm -hmm. argument, right? When... 
one of the countries feels like they're excluded and they didn't get aid from the United States, then you say that there's increased anti-American sentiment and they get mad. So when we sent money and foreign aid to Saudi Arabia, but not Iran, why didn't we see a resurgence of terrorism in Iran? Because it's, it's not within, like it's not between different countries, it's between different groups in one country. So Saudi Arabia is relatively homogenous. There's not like different religious groups or different like social cultural groups fighting. When we give aid to countries where there's lots of internal strife and conflict, lots of different groups who hate each other and are divided along tribal lines, if you support one tribe or one group over another, that's what creates the internal armed conflicts that we're talking about under the resolution. We spent a lot of time on this. May I ask a question? Sure, we can talk about it later. Okay, Go ahead. so you say we should apply sanctions to the Houthis. How would this affect the people living in Yemen? So our argument isn't really about sanctions, right? It's about first like reassuring allies so that the allies mm -hmm. would be able to depend like on the US security guarantee and they wouldn't militarize, but second, so that Iran doesn't get mad. It's not necessarily about sanctioning. Yeah, but you, don't you specifically say that we're gonna apply sanctions to the Houthis yeah. to stop so, them from fighting? Exactly, so sanctions don't actually happen because what uniquely happens is that Iran goes to the negotiating table for the first time because they get scared. So I agree with you. Okay. Like what you're trying to get at is you want me to say that their economy goes to shambles and everything. So that's specifically what Iran wants to avoid, right? They don't want their economy to go into shambles. So what they're going to do is they're going to go to the negotiating table. That's why the US has the unique leverage. So why haven't they already negotiated? Trust. Okay, that's right. We can answer No worries, so we'll answer that. Again, I'm Vinesh Kanani, the second speaker for Mission San Jose KK on the Pro, um, and it'll just be responding to their case. The vast majority of the harms attributed to their case relate to U.S. militarism. It's A, the reason that we have anti-American sentiment and terrorism in the Middle East, but B, it's the reason that we have campaigns in Yemen and El more instability because countries like Iran don't actually trust us. However, as foreign policy explains last year, regardless of whether or not we ramp up U.S. diplomacy, you're going to see U.S. militarism. That's because A, in Saudi Arabia, we're still providing military aid with an additional $650 million funneled last year and 30,000 troops residing in the Middle East with frequent drone strikes in Syria. This is really crucial because it means that regardless of U.S. diplomacy, you still see all of their impacts trigger. But uniquely, when you vote for the affirmative side, you see a shift away from U.S. militarism to diplomacy where we can recreate our image in the Middle East and be a positive actor rather than an aggressive one that we've been for the past five years. But specifically, let's talk about terrorism. First, the fundamental issue here is that SOB 15 explains the root cause of terrorism is economic. It's not ideological. When we have countries in the Middle East that are unstable and are doing poor economically, then it means that you have greater recruitment because more people are willing to join terrorist organizations for the money. However, when the U.S. is going into the Middle East and they're providing more humanitarian aid and assistance, that is the best way that we can counter terrorism and actually bring it down. That's why in recent years, we've seen terrorism being go, go down since 2017, and U.S. presence was still high back then, which shows that the decrease in terrorism had nothing to do with a decrease in U.S. diplomacy. But second, we would say that by re-engaging the region, it's the best way that we can support allies like the Kurds in anti-terror efforts. This, again, is a great way to curtail terrorism, because historically you've seen that the Kurds were the greatest allies we had in the fight against ISIS, and it's the reason we were able to destroy the organization. Next, let's talk about Yemen. The big fundamental response here is that we would say the U.S. is the one who's been the most effective in Yemen historically. They just say that we've had frequent talks, it hasn't gone anywhere. Well, a couple months ago, we negotiated a six-month-long ceasefire in Yemen via the United Nations, and it was the longest ceasefire we've ever had. Even if they say that these agreements don't last into the long term, A, we would argue that it's much better than the situation we had before, but B, every single time we have a ceasefire, it's better than the last, and C, and most importantly, even after we ended the ceasefire in Yemen, we've seen conflict at its lowest point ever, which shows that the US is clearly bringing both actors together and decreasing polarization so we can actually have beneficial negotiations. But second, these actors are not willing to compromise without US support. That's because historically, the Houthis in Saudi Arabia just want to gain more territory. They have a ton of ideological divisions, whereas if the US comes in, they have leverage over both actors. A, with Saudi Arabia, we sell them arms, which means that if we threaten to stop giving these weapons to them, they're not going to be able to uh, have adequate defense. And B, with Iran, we've had sanctions on them, which have decimated their economy, which means we can bring, to them the, bring them to the negotiating table. That's why historically, Rand finds that when the US left the region, you saw greater cruise missile strikes against Saudi Arabia from Iran. The only way to curtail that is if the US goes in and, says, and brings both sides to the table. 
Overall, you prioritize our case for a couple of reasons. First, we would tell you that if we don't back up our allies, that means that they're going to militarize for their own security. Saudi Arabia in the past has built up weapons because they didn't think the US was actually in the region. That was really crucial because it meant that these countries were not willing to negotiate at all. If you have so many countries in the Middle East that are just escalating situations, they're getting more weapons, then you never have a path towards diplomacy, so you can't have diplomacy in any of their impacts if you have an arms race. But being more importantly, we would argue that US diplomacy is the only one that is long lasting. In fact, our set, our standing evidence finds that US brokered diplomacy lasts three times longer than diplomacy brokered by these regional actors, because again, the ideological divisions means that it never lasts. If you want long lasting peace and the only peace you've seen historically, then you vote pro. I'm just gonna start by responding to their arguments against our case. And then I'll go to responding to theirs. Is anybody not ready? The first thing they tell you is that the United States is always going to be military and engaged in the region. That's unequivocally false. You can look to the empirics. Right now, as we speak, the United States is actively disengaging from the Middle East. You can look to things like Afghanistan, where we had our largest troop withdrawals ever. The United States has its lowest troop presence in the Middle East ever, which means that their argument that we're going to uh, always have military in the Middle East is not true. However, our Cruz 15 evidence indicates that when you increase diplomacy, you inherently have to increase the military, because if you don't have leverage over a country, they're not going to listen to you. With that being said, let's go to their specific responses. The first thing they tell you is that the root cause of terror is, is, is like economic stuff. But what we're arguing is that by increasing this amount of aid, you're creating these political winners and losers. You're not actually benefiting the economic situation. You're just letting governments get more leverage over their people, which emboldens terrorism. That warranting and evidence is just conceded. The second thing they tell you is that we're going to be supporting the Kurds, which are going to somehow help us fight ISIS. There's a couple things wrong. One, we would argue that in their world, you're actually harming the Kurds because you're going to anger countries like Turkey, which has empirically done genocides against the Kurds, but two, you can't use the Kurds to fight terrorism everywhere. That's just silly. On our next argument about Yemen, their arguments here completely miss the mark. The first thing they tell you is that the United States has been most effective in Yemen and has historically got, uh, negotiated ceasefires. That is the exact problem. The ceasefires the United States has negotiated in the past have done nothing but allow the Houthis a chance to regroup and remilitarize. That's why our evidence indicates that whenever you sign a ceasefire, the Houthis see that as a weakness on the part of the Saudi Arabia and the United States, so they go on the offensive, which then forces the Saudi Arabia to respond, which prolongs the war, which which is what's going to kill millions of people. All of that evidence and warranting is completely conceded and, and just dropped out of rebuttal. Then they tell you that conflict is at its lowest point. Yes, it is, because the Houthis right now are going to naturally lose if we let the course stay. The only way that the war continues is in the affirmative world. The next response they read you is that actors are not going to compromise and the United States has leverage. That's the problem. The United States being allied with Saudi Arabia disallows it for being an effective mediator. That's what the Fearney evidence indicates. Think about it. Your friend of the a uh, friend of your enemy is not your friend. You're, they're still considered your enemy. Lastly, they tell you to prioritize their argument because the United States has been three times better at prioritizing peace. That's an unequivocal lie. We asked for the evidence. It no way in any shape or form says that. Let's go to their case. On their first argument about emboldening adversaries, there's a bunch of problems. First, the Bauer evidence indicates that right now we physically don't have enough diplomats and already critical roles are going under Philip. That's crucial because if we don't have enough physical people, it means that you can't negotiate any deals, which is a prerequisite to every argument they've read. The second thing comes from Ani22. They tell you that the United States disengaging from the region has shattered our faith in our regional role. That's crucial because the Makhlouf evidence indicates that right now the United States has terrible credibility and the Rana evidence indicates that credibility is the basis for diplomacy. Think about it. If the United States has no credibility, it's impossible for us to enact any diplomatic reforms. Then they tell you that the United States is going to bind Iran to a new deal. No, the deal is happening in the status quo. However, Iran, if the United States gets engaged, will see that as an aggression and will not get in the deal. Then they tell you that absent the United States, Iran dominates. We would tell you that Iran is a belligerent actor and will probably do this regardless. But then secondly, our evidence indicates that when the United States left, Iran has actually started to talk for Saudi Arabia for the first time. On their second argument about Gulf relations, one, remember that having diplomats and having credibility is a prerequisite here because you can't actually solve anything without either of those things. But on these specific arguments, on their thing about defending allies, the Fearney evidence, again, is fabulous. They are, themselves are advocating for supporting Saudi Arabia, but that disallows us 
from being effective mediators on their next argument about security commitments in Yemen. One, remember that the ceasefires they talk about are the root cause of the Yemen war. Two, we would argue that regional groups are five times better at fostering peace. And three, our evidence indicates that that's why the United States' peace agreements never or not, fail 94% of the time. For all these reasons, Daniel and I are very proud to be gay. So you say that with the ceasefires we had in Yemen, it meant that the Houthis could build up their army. But yeah. you say because of that, conflict is at its lowest point. How does that make sense? No, we don't say because of these ceasefires are at its lowest point. Our evidence and our argument is that the Houthis right now are in a natural pace to lose it. That's because... But how... Both, can I <clears throat> finish, please? Both sides see, are beginning to see the war as a stalemate because fighting has just continued with little progress. That's crucial because it means that in the current trajectory, our evidence indicates that there's going to be a natural conclusion to the war, but affirming and doing these premature peace talks uh -huh. gives the Houthis a chance to get back in it because they think they have a so, chance. Could I take a question? The reason that's a little silly is if the Houthis had such a great opportunity to remilitarize and build up their army, then how come right now everything is balanced? Because before right. the ceasefire, the Houthis right. were attacking Saudi right. Arabia. So, if they right. were just building right. their armies, why do things be I would love to answer that. So, our evidence indicates that because the war is heading to a stalemate, Iran uh -huh. right now is pulling their forces out. That's crucial because okay. Iran primarily backs the Houthi rebels. If Iran is backing themselves out of the war, that weakens the Houthis and it's what's going to lead to a it's what's going to lead to them losing the war. However, if there's a ceasefire that's negotiated by the United States, which you yourself say is a heavily allied with Saudi Arabia, Iran then thinks that they have a chance to win the war, and then that's when they re-interject all of their military presence. I'm going to respond on to that really quickly. You've been on this for 30 seconds. Really quickly. The problem is that right before that, right before the ceasefire, you saw that Iran was engaging more in the region. So if you're saying that the Houthis were able to build up their forces, Clearly, they didn't, considering they stopped aggressions post Iran being the in the region does not mean that they're increasing. I'm but you, you had more aggression push. before the ceasefire. I'm going to take a push. Go for it. That's all right. All right. Well, let's talk about your argument about allies. Now, mm -hmm. let's say there's somebody. Let's play. Let's have a thought experiment. Okay. Let's say there's somebody that you really, really hate. You, you guys are arch nemesis, and they have a friend. Are you going to be? Are you going to be friends with that friend? No, but Saudi Arabia okay, is perfect. a friend. The argument is perfect. just about our friends. Perfect. Perfect. Now let's. Uh, take that thought experiment and let's apply it to this debate. Your argument is that somehow Iran is going to negotiate with the United yeah. States. The uh, United States is the only is the primary actor that is funding the Saudi Arabian genocide. So your yeah. example, you yeah. just told me, Iran doesn't like Saudi Arabia by proxy. Iran's not going to like the United States, so peace never exactly. gets done. Exactly, that's the issue. Iran doesn't like Saudi Arabia, so they never come to the negotiating table. But the U.S. has sanctions over Iran. If that enemy of my friend owes me somehow, then they have to come to the table, whereas right. otherwise they would right. never do so. Our the argument, U.S. has leverage, that's sure, what sets them apart. Sure. Our argument is that they're probably never going to come and negotiate with each other because they're too ideologically opposed. And the I'm telling you, the I, leverage can I, can I gets you, rid of that ideological right, division. Right. The only way to actually get peace in the conflict is to let the conflict run its course, let both so countries realize... let the war let, happen, and then it's fine when it ends. Well, I'd say yes, you should stop that war end. and no. intervene, which is why yes. when the U.S. has gone but in historically, the you've seen cruise missile strikes go down. That's not true. Your evidence isn't causal. Okay, I can show you our evidence I that specifically says it's because of the U.S., but I right. asked for the for case. No, you did. I asked for the evidence that Iran increases. Do you, do you want Both arguments center around the idea that diplomacy and agreements increase. The thesis of our argument is that the only actor who can successfully bring these countries to the negotiating table is the United States with arms sales, oil purchases, and sanctions leverage. That's why even if they give you examples of Saudi Arabia and Iran coming to the table, that doesn't mean that they're successful negotiations and peace only with the U.S. pressure on both sides will they actually reach a concrete deal. As a result, Al Jazeera finds just yesterday that despite Iran having hosted talks, there have been zero results, no meetings since April of last year, and rather militarization and tensions at record-breaking levels to the brink of war while the U.S. has been disengaging from West Asia. That's why the easiest place to vote affirmative is on our second argument about repairing Gulf relations. Affirming would stabilize the region by A, reassuring allies that the U.S. is committed to protecting them, preventing countries from proliferating to protect themselves, and B, using the U.S.'s unique leverage in arms sales and security commitments to serve as a mediator between Saudi Arabia and Iran.
drawn back to these. The only response they read encompasses both arguments, and it's really bad. Their responses center around the idea that there aren't enough diplomats in the US right now. This is not a problem because we already have diplomats in the Middle East. That's how we were able to negotiate deals in the past and all of the examples that we give you. But it doesn't, so that's why it doesn't matter if there's a shortage. It just matters about how we're using those US diplomats. Their evidence isn't specific to the topic, isn't specific to the Middle East. But they also tell you that Saudi Arabia doesn't allow mediators. This completely concedes and really mishandles our argument because the argument isn't about mediators coming to the Saudi Arabia. It's about if we don't help Saudi Arabia, then they condemn and criticize the U.S. publicly and they proliferate because they think that the U.S. is not helping them anymore. But they rely on the idea that ceasefires brokered by the U.S. cause more conflict. But Videsh already tells you in rebuttal that diplomacy is on the decline right now because the U.S. has been withdrawing from the region. All of that evidence has been conceded. Devastatingly, our current path to an arms race in war in Yemen would launch West Asia into chaos, making the region more prone to miscalculation and conflicts killing millions. The reason why our arguments always come before theirs is because they 100% dropped what Videsh already tells you on Wang. Our argument about regional militarization comes as a fundamental prerequisite because countries would never engage in diplomacy and would always resort to their weapons when there's an arms race and rampant distrust. But second, our argument also supercharges their impact because if all of these countries have so many more weapons, then conflicts such as those in Yemen become 10 times worse with everyone playing around with nuclear weapons. But our argument also short circuits theirs about because if the conflict in Yemen doesn't improve, then the US has to intervene more militarily and more people die. Let's talk about their arguments, which is another incredibly easy way to vote a firm Let's talk about what Videsh tells you. They tell you ceasefires allow the Houthis to regroup, but that's the exact definition of a ceasefire. While the Houthis can remilitarize, so can Saudi Arabia. As long as there's no violence and conflict, our argument is still true. That's why they stopped aggression post the ceasefire. That's what Videsh tells you in uh, Second Cross. But also, they conceded that terrorism has been going down since 2017 when the U.S. was in the region, and they just say that there's political losers and winners, but the root cause of terrorism is economic factors. People don't join these terrorist organizations if they're poor, so if our side increases to humanitarian aid, then that solves back from terrorism and all of their impacts. Violence on net decreases vote for peace and vote for the affirmative. The order of the speech is very simple. I'm going to be talking about their case and then our case. Or actually, yeah, that'll do that. Their case, then our case. Is everybody ready? All right. <clears throat> Starting on their case, the most important thing in this round is that they cannot access any of their impacts without proving that U.S. diplomacy would be successful. There are two major barriers to U.S. diplomacy being successful. The first is the shortage of diplomatic personnel that Yash describes in his summary. We currently do not have enough diplomatic personnel in the United States, and they want to increase diplomacy. How are we going to increase diplomacy if we simply do not have enough diplomatic personnel to actually fill these roles? Clearly, they're not going to actually gain the benefits of diplomacy if we don't have enough diplomats to fill the roles. The more important thing is that we have no credibility in the Middle East. Biden is hated in West Asia right now, per Ani 22. And more importantly, per Rana 22, credibility is the key to diplomacy. Without any credibility, there's absolutely no way that we are going to actually make any progress with diplomacy. And because the US doesn't have any credibility, diplomacy will never occur. Now onto their specific arguments. First, on adversaries. First of all, we cannot actually negotiate with our adversaries because of biased mediation. The whole entire idea is that we're so heavily allied with Saudi Arabia that Iran would never want to negotiate with the United States because we're such a huge friend of their adversary. There is no reason that Iran wants to negotiate with the US when we're the ones who are funding Saudi Arabia to engage in proxy conflicts against Iran. Biased mediation never works. That's why US-backed ceasefires and peace deals fail 94% of the time. On the other hand, regional groups without the US involved are five times more likely to solve for these proxy wars. Remember, Iran is coming to the table right now and negotiating with Saudi Arabia and with the U.S. with the Iran deal. If the U.S. reaffirms diplomacy, this is just going to anger Iran because they see the U.S. is trying to meddle in the region. This is terrible. It will stop Iran coming from the nuclear deal. Remember, Iran and Saudi Arabia are negotiating right now. This is amazing. And even if the talks haven't gone anywhere yet, this is the best thing we've seen that Iran and Saudi Arabia, mortal enemies, are talking. And the reason? Because the U.S. is no longer in the region. Now I'm going to tell you why we win. First on terror, they completely misunderstand the argument. The argument is that U.S. aid inevitably helps some groups over others. The U.S. is going to support some groups and denounce others. This makes them hate the United States, and empirically anti-Americanism increases terror. This leads to failed states that spill over in both regions. This outweighs all of their conflict scenarios because we are creating conflict throughout the Middle East, throughout West Asia. Their only response is that terrorism is caused by economics. This makes no sense. Why would someone blow themselves up? 
and kill other people simply because they're poor. The reason people commit terrorism is because they have a mortal hatred of the United States because the United States creates social and political winners and losers. Now on Yemen, remember what we tell you, ceasefires prolong the conflict because it allows both sides to regroup, rebuild their military, and get ready to kill more people. Remember, the conflict is almost over. Iran is decreasing support for the Houthis. We need to let the conflict end on its own. Premature diplomacy and ceasefires will allow both sides to regroup and prolong the conflict forever into the future. And if we allow to prolong the conflict until 2030, 1.3 million people will die. Remember, we are the only ones who actually impact out to a current war, and our terror argument spills over throughout the Middle East, as opposed to them only talking about Saudi Arabia and Iran. It's a clear ballot for the negation. Um, can we take, yeah, can we take the first question? Sure. Okay, okay. okay, can I get it? Yeah, go ahead. So you say that there's gonna be nuclear proliferation in the Middle East. Does a single so, country in the Middle East have nukes? Yeah, so, so that comes from the Rubini, Yeah, that comes from the Rubini case evidence, which indicates that the U.S. disengaging would set off Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Egypt, and Iran. But moreover, uh, thirty countries. The US already disengaged. Hold on, really Sorry. quickly, right? Another one is Velasco, which indicates that upwards 30 countries are starting on proliferating nuclear programs right now, and that more are still thinking about it because U.S. is disengaging. They don't have any other choice but to do that to protect themselves. Okay, so my question is, right, we tell you that Saudi Arabia is going to win the war and that the U.S. being in the region only hurts them. Why would Saudi Arabia want to proliferate nuclear weapons if they're having less war because of the U.S.? So the reason that's a little ridiculous and is because Saudi Arabia has come out and called for the U.S. to come back in the region. They say they want more U.S. support because they don't feel they're protected. So I would argue that U.S. engagement only backs up Saudi Arabia, and right now they're not winning the war. You've seen Iran has been launching more right. cruise missile strikes against Saudi Arabia than ever before. That's because right. of U.S. Well, that cruise missile strike evidence, first of all, was from March of last year. It was from 20. Yeah. Yeah, it was from March of last year. Yeah, so that's the U.S. not ever from that. ever before. The U.S. Also, began pulling out in 2020. Okay. Can so I ask another question? Wrong. Can I ask another question? Yeah, go for it. Okay, so if we're increasing diplomacy in Yemen, wouldn't that mean the U.S. is trying to end the conflict, not support Saudi Arabia and allow them to fight better? If we're, yeah. trying, to no. end, if yeah. we're trying to do diplomacy in Yemen, wouldn't that actually yeah. be the opposite of what you're talking about? Right. Because we're trying to not support Saudi Arabia and get right. them to stop fighting? These are two different arguments. One is that now Saudi Arabia doesn't fear for their security, so they don't proliferate. And the second is that they still want to end Yemen. We brought Iran to the table, we brought Saudi Arabia to the table because we have leverage over both. But Saudi Arabia listens to us because we sell them arms, Iran listens because of sanctions, yeah, and we've told Saudi Arabia to stop attacks against Iran. So it's not right. like we're just one-sided. Okay. We looked at both. Okay, no, so I mean, let if, me ask if, you. If, okay. if I have, let's say I have a friend who's in a fight. Okay, we fight, with these analogies. No, okay, no, so no. I like these analogies are good, right? Let's do another thought experiment. If I have a friend who's in a fight and they're fighting someone else, mm -hmm. I'm not just going to be like, I'm going to probably back up my friend, right? Especially or if you'll tell like, both of them to stop because like, you think the friend should fight each other. Let me, let me like, ask you another question. Can I ask another no, no, follow-up? Wait, wait, wait. Let's, just that's a good analogy. Friend. That's a okay. solid yeah. analogy. If my friend is in a fight, I don't want them to be in a fight. I don't want instability. Right. So I'll say, want hey, you should fight. probably not be fighting this if other guy. I'll bring both of them to the negotiation If you don't want them to be in a fight, why are you giving them AK-47 so that they can shoot the other people? Because... We're telling them that we're because we're giving you all these weapons, that means that suddenly, if you start attacking these other countries, we're gonna stop giving you the weapons, right? They can Why keep give those them weapons, the they can keep those weapons for security, logic. but they can't That's use That's ridiculous them logic. If we didn't want them to be in a fight, we wouldn't give them Here's weapons. The the if, wait, but can then I, they can, can I, get can the I, weapons, can I finish responding? Yeah, yeah, okay. If we really wanted peace, we wouldn't be giving them weapons in the first place. But if every we're giving country them, has weapons, giving, that's like, why would we be like, hey guys, we're gonna give you that's a, drones, tanks, and AK-47s, but you guys should be using weapons to be peaceful. You're you're right. Right. Size okay. size okay. weapons, they can get weapons regardless. We can address regardless. this over. in the final speeches. Sure, sure. Okay. It'll start on the negative case and then move on to the affirmative. Is anyone not ready? Right. Starting with this idea of Yemen, it's been really mishandled by opponents because they think that the best solution to the crisis in Yemen is to let conflict run its course and eventually things will work out. No, if a war continues to happen, then that still means there's going to be violence on both sides. We're advocating for an end to that war. They argue that we can never negotiate peace because we're allies with Saudi Arabia. Well, that's ridiculous considering we just negotiated a ceasefire a couple months ago. 
We're being less biased in the region where we're saying Saudi Arabia, our ally, cannot continue attacks or else they don't get arms sales. And we're telling Iran that they cannot attack or else they get sanctioned. They just say that if we're giving weapons to Saudi Arabia, they can use that against Iran. That's a little ridiculous because every single nation in the world has weapons. If we don't give weapons to Saudi Arabia, they'll just build up their own military and then attack Iran. That's why U.S. arms sales are the best way that we can have leverage because A, it means that you guarantee Saudi Arabia security so they don't have to attack Iran and get into a conflict, but B, it also means we have that leverage. With that, let's talk about the wing because this has also been severely mishandled. We tell you that when you have an arms race and all of our allies building up weapons, then that means other countries in the Middle East, our adversaries like Iran, also build up nuclear weapons. That means that you have more instability and it precludes diplomacy. Every single country is getting these weapons, they can't trust each other, so they're never willing to end conflicts. This also increases terrorism because when these countries are investing in their military rather than their people, it creates the conditions for terrorism. With that, let's talk about terrorism really quickly. First, they just say there's political winners and losers, but what they ignore throughout the entire round is that the root cause of terrorism is economic. If the US goes in the region and they provide aid, I'd say that's the best solution you have, which is why empirically since 2017, even when the US was in the region, terrorism went down. Finally, on our case, they just argue that we don't have diplomats, we can't solve conflict. A, we have diplomats, it's just a matter of how we use those diplomats in the Middle East, which is why we were able to negotiate a ceasefire a couple months ago. But second, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and other allies are calling for us to re-engage in the region, so obviously they want us to be there, which is why overall, they completely concede our case, which shows absent and US um, intervention. It means we're gonna have an arms race, you're gonna have more conflict, so even if you don't wanna look to the whole Yemen scenario, you still vote right here. We need to support our allies and prevent this massive proliferation. Vote con. Or pro, sorry. 17. Their case, our case. Everyone ready? There's two concessions that are going to sign your ballot. First is on the credibility. Ani 22 evidence is fabulous and has gone conceded in every single speech. It tells you that the United States withdrawing from the Middle East has shattered faith in the regional role. That's confirmed by the Makhlouf evidence and the Rana evidence, which is fabulous. And again, it's just gone conceded and 100% unresponded to tells you that credibility is the basis for diplomacy without any credibility in the region, which is the all what our evidence indicates. The United States cannot do any diplomacy that's just absolutely conceded and it ends the round. The second thing is on the fact that we don't have to diplomats. They massively mishandle this. Yes, we may have diplomats in the status quo, but the act is advocating for an increase. Our evidence indicates that we don't have diplomats to increase, which means you can't do diplomacy in the first place. Both of these are prerequisites to any benefits and have been functionally conceded. The third thing that is fabulous is the percentages on peace. Remember that our evidence indicates that U.S. peace agreements fail 94% of the time, while regional cooperations are five times more likely to actually foster peace. Both of those statistics are absolutely conceded and, again, are reasons why the status quo is a lot better than their world. Let's go to Yemen. They just say that they're advocating for an end. That's ridiculous. They've ignored the empirics that when the United States has tried to broker ceasefires, all it has done is embolden the Houthis and lead Iran to re-engage, which re-exacerbates the conflict and is going to lead to millions of people dying by 2030. Yes, every country may have weapons, but the United States is uniquely key to funding this war, which means that they're uniquely bad in it. If you want to end a war, why would you give guns to the people who are starting it? Also, remember that there's talks right now between Iran and Saudi Arabia in the status quo, record-breaking talks that are only because the United States disengaged and these people can come back to the table. Let's go to our argument about terror. It's fabulous. Remember that the top Dermat evidence from case is conceded. It tells you that USAID, which is a part of diplomacy, creates political winners and losers where the losers feel outraged. They just say that terror is because of economics, but them creating these political winners and losers are exacerbating economic inequalities, which worsens terror, which is going to lead to state collapse, which is a prerequisite to all of their arguments because if there's a state collapse and there's conflict throughout the Middle East that's probably wider in scope and it's going to lead to a lot more deaths. Again, we're the only side that specifically impacts out the deaths. We don't have diplomats. We don't have credibility. We're way worse at fostering peace. Negate. Good round. Thank you so much for judging. Thank you. Good round. Good job.